The honorary degree will now be conferred. Mr. President, will you present the honorary degree candidate, Carrie Fowler? Mr. Chancellor, each era gives birth to leaders who, by virtue of intellect and imagination, inspire us to face the major challenges of our times. Dr. Kerry Fowler is one such individual. For more than 30 years, he has championed the conservation of the world's genetic plant heritage for this and future generations. He earned his BA in sociology at Simon Fraser University in 1971. He then returned to the United States, where he sought conscientious objection status and worked in a hospital in North Carolina. After completing his PhD at the University of Uppsala in Sweden, he set out with single-minded determination to preserve agriculture and biodiversity, a cause for which he has been a fierce advocate ever since. Throughout his career, Kerry Fowler has initiated worldwide educational campaigns and developed far-reaching conservation programs. He has traveled the globe, sharing his message through countless lectures, radio, television, and film interviews. He has authored five books and 75 articles about plant genetics research. As professor and director of research in the Center for International Environment and Development Studies at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences, he inspired students with impassioned lectures about the need for careful stewardship of the world's plant resources. As early as the 1970s, together with Canadian Pat Mooney, he proposed the establishment of international seed banks, a brilliantly prescient plan later adopted by the United Nations. Subsequently, Kerry Fowler worked to see that plan realized. As a senior officer for the Food and Agriculture Organization, he headed the secretariat that drafted the first report on the state of the world's plant genetic resources and played an instrumental role in negotiations for the Global Plan of Action on Plant Genetic Resources, adopted by 150 countries in 1996. He then served as senior advisor to the Secretary General of the World Food Summit, and the culmination of his dream was realized in 2006 with the building of the Svalbard International Seed Vault in Norway. This global seed bank is our Noah's Ark, and it will provide a practical means to reestablish crops obliterated by major disaster. Today, as the executive director of the Global Crop Diversity Trust, he continues to provide courageous and visionary leadership to ensure our food security. In 1985, with Pat Mooney, he was jointly awarded the Right Livelihood Award and now we pay tribute to this great humanitarian. Mr. Chancellor, on behalf of the Senate of this university, I ask that you confer upon Kerry Fowler the degree Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa. Kerry Fowler, by virtue of the authority vested in me and in the Senate of this university, I hereby admit you to the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa. Dr. Fowler will be hooded by Dr. Bill Crane, Associate Vice President Academic, and Ms. Kate Roth, Registrar.
It is with pleasure that I now call on Dr. Kerry Fowler for his convocation address. Dr. Fowler? Uh, Mr. Chancellor, Mr. President, distinguished guests, graduates. First, congratulations to the graduates. It's a special day for all of you, and thanks to this university to, to which I owe so much myself. I don't have to tell any of the graduates today that preparation is everything. The university's motto, thinking of the world, really gives evidence to this. Uh, a fan once congratulated the uh, golfing great Arnold Palmer on his good luck during one of the rounds of golf that he was playing, and, and Arnold Palmer said back to him, you know, it's funny. The more I practice, the luckier I get. Many of us, and I think particularly those of us with formal education and higher incomes, take for granted the most basic necessities of life, and thus we are ill-prepared for surprises. We know that we'll have three good meals a day, and we know that the food system of the world will take care of a rising population. We assume this. But the poor cannot be so cavalier. They cannot be so cavalier about where the next meal is coming from, and we should not be so naive as to think that something so essential as an adequate and secure food system is guaranteed. There are no entitlements in the biological world. A few short decades from now, agricultural crops will face an entirely new growing environment, and in many countries of the world, the coldest growing seasons of the future will be hotter than even the hottest ever recorded in the past. Here's change you can believe in. The 11 hottest years on record have all occurred in the last 13. Should we assume that rice and wheat and corn will be unaffected even if they are grown in conditions in which they have never experienced? We shouldn't. This is not a plea for us to prepare to drop food aid out of the skies. We're neither going to be able to FedEx or um, buy our way out of this coming crisis. We have to produce our way out of it. So preparation is essential, and it's particularly essential when our timing is bad, and it appears that our timing is bad. Just this year, we've had a food crisis, we've had an energy crisis, we've had a climate crisis, we've had a financial crisis, and of course we have, this adds to water and environmental crises. None of these crises went away, we just, keep, uh, we just kept adding them. But agricultural crises, food crises, have a way of trumping all the others. There's never going to be a good time to secure the biological foundation of our agricultural system. But we know that if agriculture fails to adapt to climate change, so will we. We have to therefore fashion agricultural systems that produce more food more sustainably with less water, less energy. If we don't, the other crises in the world will simply spiral out of control. So let me be clear and scientific at the same time and say we can solve this crisis. We can do it without fancy technologies. We can do it without going back to the Stone Age. And we can do it without breaking the budget. The most underappreciated and undervalued resource and the most potent tool that we have lies in the crops themselves, in the natural diversity that exists in our agricultural crops in the 200,000 different varieties of wheat and the two to 400,000 different varieties of, of uh, rice. This diversity is a treasure trove of traits that can be used by plant breeders and farmers to breed new crop varieties that are heat resistant, insect and pest resistant, drought tolerant, 
and climate ready. At the Global Crop Diversity Trust, where I work, we are working to collect and conserve <clears throat> each unique variety and to uncover the valuable traits that they hold. We have identified the most vulnerable varieties and I'm confident enough to say that in the next three years we will rescue from extinction between 100,000 and 150,000 unique crop varieties. Two samples of each of these are going to go in seed banks around the world and one is going to go in the Svalbard Global Seed Vault near the North Pole. Underpinning and ensuring the future food supply of humanity for generations to come. It's true, we're going to have to do even more than this, but conserving crop diversity is the logical first step and it's the prerequisite for solving the food crisis and ensuring that agriculture copes with climate change and other crises. It's painfully evident to me that short-term thinking in this world has led to long-term problems which are not going to be solved by more short-term thinking. We can and we must do better than this. Mark Twain once quipped that uh, cauliflower was nothing but broccoli with a college education. At our best universities, we endow professorial chairs. It's time that we decided to endow wheat and broccoli as well and to use the best of our scientific knowledge to ensure that our agricultural crops are at least as well prepared as you graduates to face the future. Now, it's customary when giving a talk like this for someone like me to give a few words of advice to the graduates. I want to be a little bit humble about that. Um, but I'll give you two quick words of advice. The first concerns the long term. Follow your passion, whether your passion is poetry or plants and your career will take care of itself. And the second is some short-term advice, and that is have some fun today. You deserve it. <laughs> but don't be selfish because your families are involved in this as well. This is a rare occasion for them. Allow them to have some fun as well. Thank you very much again. I'm deeply honored by the doctorate that you've given me today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fowler.